Mr. Emilio Balbaran, as he answers a very important question. Is the Philippine economy entering the golden age? So with that, we'd like to uh, introduce uh, to introduce Mr. Babia, may I please call Mr. Ernesto Francisco Jr., CFA. Mr. Francisco is CFA Philippines Vice President for Academic Relations. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Salamat. Magandang umaga, Pilipinas. Mayong buntag, Cebu. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Nilo Bandiran or Ronnie. He is currently an infrastructure and national budget consultant to the Department of Tourism and the Department of Public Works and Highways or DPWH under USA project entitled Advancing Philippine Competitiveness or Compete where he leads a team of technical experts, consultants, and research associates in providing technical assistance to the national government agencies in their regional offices, local government units, business associations, in doing economic and political reform in the field of infrastructure to support the competitiveness of tourism, agribusiness, and manufacturing. Part of his complete activities are the planning, budgeting, and implementation of tourism roads for DOT and DPWH Convergence on Tourism Infrastructure Program for a multi-year budget allocation nationwide of 75 billion pesos for 2013 to 2016 feasibility, feasibility study and technical facilitation of the Laguna Lakeshore Express Way Bank Project, a PPP project worth 123 billion pesos, the largest PPP uh, plan today. He's also in charge of the planning and budgeting of around 4 billion water supply infrastructure for waterless municipalities uh, called DOP, DPWH, LWA, and NAPC Convergence Program on tourism water amendment of the infrastructure raw law. Prior to complete project, he was team leader for both partnerships for better infrastructure and tourism development and the DOT DPWH convergence program for tourism roads convergence projects. He was also the project coordinator for the drafting of the maritime code of the Philippines uh, with the Center for Research and Communication. Ronnie graduated and was a faculty member of the University of Asia and the Pacific School of Economics and an economist at the First Metro Investment Corporation, University of Asia and the Pacific Capital Market Research. He was involved in local and foreign assistance projects in the field of shipping, trade financing, forecasting, low cost housing, and rationalization of fiscal incentives, advertising, microfinance industry assessment, downstream oil industry, trade and transport, and logistics. Wow. He teaches part time at the Holy Angels University MBA program and at the University of Asia and the Pacific Executive Business Economic Program. He is currently taking up his doctorate degree in urban and regional planning at the University of the Philippines. It's my privilege and honor, ladies and gentlemen, to give you Mr. Ronnie Badmira. Uh, and uh, relatable to the world of uh, finance. 
So, uh, and I request that we, we just uh, prioritize uh, my slides more than my face. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you, will, uh, you will get more from my slides than the uh, close up uh, video of my okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, I will be presenting you uh, to you 75 slides. Uh, don't worry, it will be very, very short, and we can try to. Uh, to speak with the 30 minutes. So, it's very difficult to discuss economics and uh, I was given this title. Uh, uh, it was imposed upon me. So, and it is a rather upgraded difficulty of explaining economics and trying to explain it in the terms of golden age. So, is the Philippine economy entering a golden age? So, that's my, my mission in the next 30 minutes. So, uh, what is economic golden age and what is... As a teacher, I would always want to stick with frameworks. So, at the end of the day, with all the 70 slides of information, data, you won't even remember or recognize those. But what I want to leave with you is uh, our frameworks that you can bring with you so that when uh, faced with so many uh, data, news items of BBC, CNN, Bloomberg, you have framework, you have frameworks that will enable you to filter whatever it is that is only useful for you. Okay? So, what is the framework for assessing the economic status of a nation? And then from that framework, we evaluate whether we are actually entering a golden age. And then, uh, as finance students, uh, yes, we're talking about your career and financial wellness, but it's important also that you realize uh, what Mr. Gobier was saying, was telling you while ago that when the finance sector has a huge impact on the total economy. So you do your job well, you'll be technically sharp in the field of finance, and mind you, our, our country badly needs very, very sharp financial analysts. Okay? So uh, let's move forward. Uh, So, Golden Age, of course, Wikipedia will tell us that uh, it was from philosopher Hesiod. But it's a period of great peace, prosperity, and happiness. Wow, what, what terms, huh? Peace, prosperity, and happiness. So, uh, an endeavor of a great task were accomplished. But uh, we will concentrate not on the Golden Age as philosophers of Greece would have it, but let's concentrate on the economic Golden Age, which was actually uh, uh, which actually happened uh, after the World War II. So, uh, it's basically long boom of income growth. Okay, so, but let's move forward. Uh, high growth of income, low growth of prices, and less unemployment. So, in presenting to you that, I wish to present to you some models, and by definition, uh, models are simplified versions of reality. So, when you do your financial models, those are not realities. Those are simplified versions of your evaluation of a certain project. So, there's no such thing as unrealistic model because models are by definition unrealistic. But they must be useful. So models, there are no right or wrong models. They are only useful and not useful models. So, let me present to you some context by which I will present to you the frameworks. So, uh, according to our government, good news, most powerful economies have broken down and are still in a shaky report. And then, Philippine economy is one of the leaders, the Victorians of uh, the world. And therefore, good governance is uh, historic growth leads to, yeah, government is so good, tuwid na daan, good governance is good economics. That's according to our government. About some bad news, there are critics that say, oh, well, the government, after collecting so much tax, 32%, uh, now they're not spending it. And according to Professor Ben Jokno, from 2011 to 2014, uh, we were not able, the government was not able to spend 500 billion worth of budget that was collected from the taxpayers. So, uh, therefore, according to critics, poverty level is the same, unemployment and joblessness will not change, they are still hungry, the same number of hungry people, and uh, some critics will tell us to eat at the anti-man. 
But how do we now uh, evaluate which one is correct? So therefore, uh, another context of, in which uh, our discussions now, sa reunions ninyo, sa mga, sa atin sa coffee, mga coffee meetings ninyo, pinag-uusapan nyo na rin ang economy, hindi lang uh, politics, hindi lang si Adab. Okay, so, okay, ah. Uh, maraming pasit. Okay. Uh, mix of better news and bitter news. Uh, Pope's visit, Mama Sakano. And then, on the other hand, uh, what will happen in 2016? What if we elect the wrong leader? Our economy will crash. Oh, my goodness. What is it really true? So, and then the first report, quarter report, lowest GDP in the last three years, 5%. Okay, and then the second, uh, I, I was watching ANC, they were at 10 o'clock in the morning at the time that they were about to, the, the NCP, PSA was about to release the second quarter report. Everybody was excited. In the stock market, PSA, they are all reporting, and then uh, the report came out, 5.6%. And those, the stock market did not know what to do. <laughs> so from 2% at the trading day, at 10 o'clock, it was already zero. 0.1, 0.2, and then that already started further deterioration up to the closing yesterday at 6,000. Okay, so with all these emotions, opinions about our government, about each other, so we find the music that what's really happening. And so we must meet with, with frameworks, with filters. So um, let's ask ourselves, how should we feel about all this? So, I can't ko lang ng insight out. So, may dibati si, may dibati si uh, Joy, tsaka si Sakis. There are good careers in the center, in the WH, in the OTC, and we need to equip our government with graduates like you. Okay? So, and we start with this. Okay? The need for models. And uh, may misunderstanding of the point. <laughs> okay, so basically, you've learned about this. Economics is all about the, uh, the management of the household. We came from the root word oiko, which means habitat, household, yeah, ecology, then. But basically, at the center of economics is man. Man's unlimited, multiple, competing needs and wants. Don't ever forget the second half of this, of this definition. You allocate scarce resources to satisfy man. Some textbook definitions of economics has dropped, have dropped the second part of the definition, which is satisfying man. Naputo dun sa science of allocation of scarce resources. Then they drop man. So once you do that, or once you reverse the equation, you are allocating man to satisfy existing resources. And once you do that, once you do that, you accept that all these 3,000 students that I am talking to right now cannot even think of ways to expand our resources to benefit more people because you're just limiting yourself with the existing resources. How about expanding the resources? Okay, so that's very good. So the, sum of the word scarce came from the root word excur, which means something was blocked out, which the root word of excerpt, which cannot satisfy you, and excerpt cannot satisfy you. Anyway, go, moving forward, we, what is golden age? So in my personal uh, reflection last night, probably the equation for a golden age is economic development, which we studied from economic history and economic development, but it's defined as economic growth plus alpha. 
Wow, so what is alpha and what is economic growth? So we will try to, uh, well, this is how I imagine it. There are fundamentals without which growth and economic growth and national development uh, would be shaky and not sustainable. And then you will have growth, you will have sustainability and competitiveness, and then you will have um, um, okay. inclusive growth, and then from there we can have quality of life and happiness. So peace, prosperity, and happiness. So mind you, that's the goal of uh, economics: quality of life and happiness. Okay. So uh, let's uh, have an executive summary of those. For the fundamentals, it's important that you have savings, reserves, and infrastructure. For growth, you have you should have consumption and infrastructure spending. That's the power of an infrastructure project. It is both building your fundamental and while you're building the infrastructure project, you are already multiplying the money, employing people, so the money is circulating already. That will push growth. So that the problem of our uh, the problem of our GDP growth is that we had negative twenty four percent in government spending in the first quarter of 2015. That's the problem. We, that's why we're not achieving that growth that we wanted. Okay, and then sustainability and competitiveness. Once we have that growth, it's important that you manage and you govern it in a good way, in an ethical way. So the first uh, two speakers a while ago emphasize on ethics. So you you cannot you cannot enjoy growth without that governance, without that ethics. So, and it's important that you will have entitled citizens. We Filipinos love to complain, correct? But we don't know how to demand good services from our government. We don't know how to demand good products from our suppliers. Nahihiya tayo. But if we complain, make sure that it's part of our entitlement. We pay our taxes as part of entitled citizens. We demand good products and good services from our suppliers and from our people. That's, that's the mark of a golden age citizen. So, private sector, outside money, exchange rate, prices, and costs. But let's talk about inclusive growth. What is inclusive growth? Our, our government analysts have been trying to break their heads in analyzing why have we grown 5 to 6% in the last five years and the unemployment rate and new jobs data have not improved. Why does it not translate to employment? Because According to Dr. Villegas, the formula for inclusive growth, growth that translates to jobs, is 8 to 10 percent in the next 8 to 10 years consecutively. That's what China did in making sure that 300 million Chinese elevated from the poor class to the middle class. 300 million additional middle class Chinese. So, what's their formula? They have grown in the last decade 8 to 9, 8 to 10 percent in the last 8 to 10 years. That should be our formula. So, and then social safety nets, I'm glad that the DSWD was very, very, it was and is very, very serious about the CCD, the Conditional Cash Transfer in Tagalog, Pantawid, Familia Program. Familia Filipino program, yeah, for business area. Yeah. So, because, according to John Maynard Keynes, in the long run, we are all dead. So, therefore, the government has to take care of those who are hungry in the short run. And we cannot wait for five to six years of build up of infrastructure. So, therefore, we need to give our people, hungry citizens, direct cash transfer. So, that's the beauty of the social safety. The problem is, you give them their social safety net so that they can wait for the infrastructure projects, but we have not built our infrastructure projects earlier. So hopefully our infrastructure project will accelerate in a pace that will overtake our need, the needs of our CCD families. So, and 
then you have the quality of life and happiness. That's the ultimate goal. Okay? So the golden age. However, the countries have actually become rich, have the quality of life, but they are still not happy. If you miss the point of being happy, which is actually about yourself, your perfection, and your family, being selfless in your family, then you're like a, a Roman time. Are you familiar with the, with the, this thing called vomitory? That's a vomitory. It's a room where you vomit. In the, in, the, in the golden age of the Roman Empire, they are so rich. Every, every hour, every day, there's food on the table. There's always fiesta. Every hour, every day. So what do they do? They want to consume, they want to be, you know, satisfied with other food, but uh, they're already full. So what they will do is to go to the bumpy tickle their, their clothes with a feather or whatever, and then they will vomit. And now they are ready to be satisfied again. So that's not the point of happiness. The point of happiness being selfless and letting and making each other grow as a nation so inclusive. So, <laughs> models of understanding the economy. Well, uh, I present you three frameworks. One man, economy as a house, and economy as a man. But uh, this will be very quick because this is just a review of what you've learned from your second year uh, economics class. But uh, I am sure that you did not understand your GDP. Because I graduated Master of Science in Industrial Economics. And I started learning it after three years of teaching economics. Okay? So it's okay that you don't understand GDP right now. So you will understand it five years from now. So, okay. so don't worry. This is the summary. Okay. GDP. Let's assume that there's one man in the economy and uh, it's a lion. <laughs> okay. So this uh, person wants to buy a drink, walk, and come for 20 pesos. What is his first problem? Since he's the only person in that particular country, he doesn't know where to buy that. And he doesn't have money to buy that. So he sees he's the only person in that particular country, what will he do? He will become a producer. And by being a, a producer, yeah, then he will pay himself his labor, his idea, his house, rent his house, and then pay himself. After paying himself, he will get uh, 20 pesos, and then he has produced 20 pesos, and then what will happen? What will happen is, oops, so there will be 20 pesos, production and firm revenue. So the question is, how much is the total GDP of this particular man? 20, 40, or 80? The GDP is total 20 pesos. That's why GDP is so powerful. That's why it took me 10 years to understand it, because it is the four sides of the same coin, if there's such a thing. Okay, so it's national consumption, national production, national employment, national income, all at the same time, approximately. So why, why approximately? Because it will get complicated when this man starts to trade with another man in another economy. But suffice to say, GDP is a measure of that. What's the meaning of the 5.6% growth of second quarter GDP report? Yeah, it's grown. No. So that 5.6 percent means that the national consumption, national consumption, and national income grew more or less by 5.6 percent. That's why in your financial models, you cannot do away with economics because you start with that assumption. What is your forecast for the revenue? Where do you peg it? What is your rediscount rate? They're all based on the analysis of GDP first more than anything else. Okay, so therefore, so, what are our numbers? To memorize these numbers, you will be famous in all Christmas party meetings, reunions, discussions. So, what is the total GDP? 12.6 trillion pesos. Or roughly 284 billion dollars. Okay, we always hear of 5.6%, 5.6%. But how much is actually our 
GDP. It's actually 12.6 trillion or 284 million dollars. But that is not the reason why we are the apple of the eye of the whole world. Not our GDP growth. It is driven by something else. And that is that something else. It's the net primary income. Forget about the rest of my slides. Just concentrate, just concentrate on this slide. And that's the reason why we are the most quote-unquote stable country in the world. Why? Our GNI, our gross national product, rewarded by World Bank and IMF to be called GNI, gross national income, is GDP plus net primary income. What is net primary income? Net primary income is the difference between the remittances of OFWs and Filipino companies abroad, that's letter A, minus B. What is B? Remittances of foreigners and foreign companies in the Philippines remitted to their home country. Question, which one is bigger, A or B in the Philippines? A. A. By how much? It's 2.6 trillion. 2.6 trillion as a percentage of gross domestic product, you are mathematical nerds here, that's how many percent? Roughly 20 percent. No country on this earth has a net primary income more than of this size, 20% in GDP. So what is the importance of that, sir? Well, even if your GDP contracted by 20% next quarter, it will be shouldered or covered by the net primary income. Just like our parents from abroad remitting to us money every month and then we're telling them, oh, we need more photocopying expenses, but you're actually drinking beer. No matter what you do, they will send money for your photocopying expenses. Correct? But of course, some of you are scholars. I was a scholar, so you have to earn your own photocopying expenses. Okay? So that is the beauty of the Philippine economy. That size, the combination of $58 billion and 20% of GDP, net primary income, no country on this earth has that amount. Even if we are a very small country in this world, the total world GDP is 78,000 billion. So if you say 78 trillion dollars, we are just a small dust in the world GDP. But in terms of primary income, net primary income, we are the superstar. We are the superstar. So, and let me present to you some of uh, the report. How small is the Philippines? Well, you have the USA, 17 trillion. Okay? And our, our country is $285 billion, $284 billion. Mind you, the defense budget of the United States to the war or activities in the Middle East and North Africa, Iraq, Iran, is roughly around $200 billion. No wonder that conflict or the presence of America will not just disappear on, on that area of the planet. Because it's just like taking away the size of the Philippine economy going back to the United States. So, okay. So, but take a look. Our population, that's why we will be the next, the next superpower. Look at our population, it's 100 million. Okay. Singapore, of course, they are very rich. Look at the GDP per capita of Singapore, eighty-two thousand dollars in PPP dollars. How much is our six thousand? There's so much room for us to grow. Are we entering the golden age? If we compare ourselves with Singapore, we are on our way. It's just like texting your texting your friend, you will have a meeting to their mama. And you are in Makati. And are you on, our, are you on your way to Trinoma? Yes, I'm on my way. I'm in Bandia. Okay? So I will say that we are entering the golden age. We are on our way, but that far. Okay? That far. Okay? So, and don't tell me that it's because of our population. That's why we are so far from the golden gate. Oh, take a look at the people density per square kilometer. The Philippines has 334 people per square kilometer. 
Look at Singapore. Singapore has 7,300 people per square kilometer. And look at their per capita GDP. Or if you want, by the same argument, Mongolia would have been so rich. Because there are only two people per square kilometer. I don't know what to do. Two people. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Greenland, you will be shocked with the word bank uh, data there. To go to work on this website now. The people per square kilometer in Iceland in Greenland is zero. How would that be? Zero. Okay. Because there are only 53,000 people in Greenland. They are so rich. So, okay, so anyway, there's, uh, the point is there's no relationship between people density and wealth. There's no relationship. I think it's going to help you discuss more. Okay. And uh, I have said, because of that, because of your population, because of population growth, you will be the next 11. Where is Thailand in that list? There is no Thailand in the place. Why? Because the population of Thailand has really, the growth of population of Thailand has really gone down to unrecovered global rate. Okay? So there's no Thailand there. Philippines is one of the next year. And if we ask HSBC, uh, yeah, so according to HSBC, by 2050, we will be up number 16 from number 33 to 36. To number 16. So, why? What's, what's fueling that? Well, population, our economy is 71%. Right with consumption. The consumption of households. That is the bane and goal of the Philippine economy. Why? What happened, whatever happens to the world, just like a global financial crisis, we are not sound so much affected. Why? Because we consume our own production. Okay, our exports went down. Okay, no problem. We sent our friends to our COVID people. Okay, so, no problem. Uh, what is the portion of the government? 11, 10% for government consumption. And another... Ouch. Okay, yeah, there. Another 2.4% from the investment side. So if you total the, the, the impact of the government is around 12 to 13% of the total economy. So if you're going to be talking about election and why it will be a Armageddon if we elect the wrong president, you're mistaken because government is just 13 to 14% of our total economy. So, if you are going to blame the government for your destiny, blame government for only 15%. <laughs> if you are so happy with what's happening in the economy, wow, FWs, 5.6% GDP growth, thank the government for just 13%. Because much of this GDP was driven by us. So we are going to go up or go down because of us. Hindi yung sabi ni Sarah Hinoy mo na there was never a formula. Pagkakaroon tayo na kakakaroon mo na. So, and then the food, much of that 70% is 43% food. So, what is that for the other countries? For the other countries, it's around 20 to 30 percent. For the rich countries, 20 to 30 percent on food. So we know that we are entering the golden age. If we reduce our percentage of our budget from 100 percent, from 40 percent to 20 percent. Okay. So anyway, this is what uh, Mr. Gobier was saying that finance is actually 8 percent of the total economy. But that's not the complete story. The 8% will drive real estate, which is 12% of our GDP. will drive construction, which is another 7%, which will drive expansion of our manufacturing firms, which is 21% of our GDP. So good financial analysis, good project evaluation is really a part of our GDP. So you do your, you do your work well and we have 
we have we can accelerate our on our way to go to teach. So the only problem is we keep on complaining about EDSA. Take a look at this figure. The Metro Manila is just 0.2% of our total 300,000 square kilometer land area of the Philippines. 0.2%. But we produce in that 0.2%, 27% of our total revenues as a country. And we house 30% of the population at night and 20% during the day. Why? Because these people are coming from Rizal, Habite, Laguna, Batangas. They are all coming in here during rush hour from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. So it's no brainer to compute that you are going to get stuck in traffic for the next 3 hours or 4 hours with 20 million daytime population in Metro Manila. So what's my point here? The point is, there is so much potential for the Philippine economy to grow. We are just maximizing just 0.2% of our land area. Yes, we're overpopulated probably in Metro Manila. So, and if you combine 4A and NCR, that's already 53% of our economy. So again, there's so much room in the other regions. There is so much potential in our economy. So uh, I would like to just present to you that this is my connection to your to your finance. According to Dr. Antonio, the way to analyze an economy is like a household. So how do you analyze a household? This is the story of everyone, the story of us. Okay, the story of us is that we earn and then we spend. Somewhere in between, we have we save or we are in the receipt. If you have so much savings, then you will have so much access to other people's money. If you don't have savings and you run out of deficit, you use your credit cards, etc., etc., then you will run out of savings and then just when you need the banks most because you need money, the banks will run away from you. And also, your friends will also run away from you. So if you have more savings, you will have more friends. You reduce your savings, you know that you will have less or fewer friends. Okay, so that's the beauty of savings that Mr. Gokier was saying. That 70% of that is because of compounding interest. So, but, what's the problem? The problem is, if you don't build your savings, you don't have cash position, you're not able to think long term. What do we mean by long term? You have so much savings, you're already a president of a bank, etc. Your problem is, I'm so stressed, I'm so tired. When can I get the coffee in London? What? I want to have breakfast in Tiffany. What? So you don't have that one. But if you don't have cash, don't have savings, what will be your problem? Your problem is your best friend, who is called Judy. You know Judy? Judy Tomperado, Judy Tomperado, Right now, the banks 
are really stressed right now because you have so much deposits. And then they don't know how to do with those deposits. And that's why they are all sleeping in the sequential deposit account, which is worth 1 trillion pesos. So, and this one. In the 2013, so we rescued the stock market because we draw from what from the SDA, one trillion from SDA, and we put it in the stock market. And in 2013, when it built, and then it went away. Now, are we afraid of the of the stock market crash, quote unquote crash right now? When you still have one trillion here, you still have one trillion in the BNBS. It's sleeping, literally. It's not being invested, literally. And the gross national income, etc. Uh, how many fast forward is? So fast forward na lang, enter, enter na lang. Okay, enter, enter, enter. And then this is the reason why we are growing with so much dollar reserves. And by the way, we've been lending to IMF, and IMF is lending to Greece, Portugal, etc. So you can tell your neighbors. By the way, we have been lending to the Europeans. We lent $1 billion. How much is the total requirement? One trillion dollars, but it doesn't matter. We we get one billion dollars. <laughs> Enter next slide. No, next slide. Okay. So and then this is the problem is uh, we we run out of uh, if we have so much balance of trade that we overtake. Pagina uh, nito, eh, kano na? We enter mo na. Kano mo na kasi wala. Okay, next, next. Okay, so in lang para lang uh, very technical discussion sa atin. Okay, sige okay, next, next. So next, next. So in short, we have we have no problem with the private sector. The government is floating with money. We don't know what to do with it. So and then yeah. So we have very account balance. Next. Okay. So next. So so much. You know, next. And that's why, if you take a look at this graph, long term investment. Next. Uh, long term GDP. Next. Uh, last 15 years is 45 percent. It is very easy to become an economist here in the Philippines. You crack all your analysis on the end of the day, the last 50 years was 45%. So if you are asked, what is your forecast for the next GDP? You, act, you answer without, without smiling, without blinking, you tell, your, you, you tell who's asking, 45%. <laughs> I'm positive it's 45%, at least. Yes, because all those all those valleys were never about the global events, but it's about us. It's a put it on and then in etc. And then in 2009, you know, we commiserated with our friends in America, in England. Oh, thank you. That's so, you know, and then after that we realized that we are sitting on top of two trillion dollars, two trillion pesos. And then all of a sudden, the following year is the fastest growth in 40 years. That's how we, how crazy Filipinos are and the Philippine economy is. So next, another one of the results are yet. So okay, oh, eto na. Uh, eto pinang maganda na. This is why we have all the resources and we have so much resources. Ano yon? The population. Remember, when you have to build, but please remember the replacement ratio 2.1. Remember, especially girls. Girls, that's mind. Remember 2.1. It is your obligation to the planet Earth to give birth for 2.1 children. <laughs> Why? 2.1. 2 is for the father and the mother to replace the father and the mother. And the point 0.1 is the margin of error. <laughs> You will not get married and you will not have children. So others will have to compensate you. Have three, four, kids. Okay? Look at Singapore. Because of their good child policy. 30 years ago, 20 years ago. What happened to them? They treated their children as economic costs. And right now, no, no woman in Singapore would want to give birth. So what are they doing now in the last five years? Free big expenses, free love boats, the tax uh, deductions for uh, marriages, for children, but it could not be over. And, so, and then, uh, click, click. who's uh, on the lead? Yeah, you know, Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa, Afghanistan, yeah, fine. 
birth rates per woman. But in the Philippines, we have 3.1. Okay? So, China and Thailand are the most at risk in the next 40 to 50 years because they are running out of children. Yes, 1.2 billion will run out in the next 60 years. Okay, so next, next time. Next time, next time. Okay, the Philippines has so much resources. Yes, can I have another two minutes to finish this? Uh, there is sufficient liquidity next. Okay, I think the other point. Okay, and celebrated poverty. Does it translate now? Our economic growth, does it translate to poverty reduction? Not so much. It's the same level. So, who among you are poor? You think you're poor? Okay, like, buddy, 20 percent of in families in task A would answer this question, they are poor. How dare they? Yeah? <laughs> How dare they? So, but what is poverty? Remember, you are very blessed to be here, but to be poor means 27 pesos per day, per person. It's just half, almost half, a dollar per day. In the Philippine statistics, special poverty statistics. 27 pesos per day. If you have 28 pesos per day, you're already starting to become middle class. <laughs> That's so sad. That's so sad. Okay, next, next. Okay, so this is the GDP. Mr. Kukir uh, uh, has already Discuss this. Okay, next, next. Okay, so get new jobs. No, look at the middle. We have not produced jobs. It is only in the last three quarters. Okay, so next, next, next. And then, of course, I computed the GNI minus inflation rate. You will know that we have not increased our purchasing power. That's the reason why. We have not actually grown. This is the statistic that will not be presented by the government. We have not increased our purchasing power. Okay, so we have so much room for growth. Next, 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 next. So, uh, last na to. So, ito na lang sasabihin ko sa inyo. Na, how do we now stimulate the economy? We stimulate the economy by memorizing these four words. So, do need 2.1 and these four words. Spending, production, employment, income. In this order. You can explain everything on earth with these four words. In that order. What is the impact of Pope's visit? Oh, there will be more, more emotion, more inspiration. Then there will be more spending, and more spending will lead to more production. More production will lead to more employment. More employment will lead to more income. And more income will lead to more spending. Multiplier. And the portion that is not enough is unemployment, and when the battle overflows, it's inflation. And uh, that's why it's very difficult to have full employment. Next. Next, 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 next. 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 So you have uh, investments, experts, and government spending. Next. Okay, so uh, next, 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 next. Okay, so do we have more spending? Well, as you can see in 2014, because of the bolus, everybody got scared. Because of the dump, lahat ng version niya, everybody got scared. Okay, next. But uh, we're hoping that in the second quarter, we have 20% growth in public construction. And that's why I'm very optimistic that the third quarter GDP is more, it will be much, much higher. So report. So if I in the stock market, I don't know, it's your money, but I bet that on November, when the third quarter GDP is released, that will be the heyday of the recovery of the stock market. So I think it's no brainer to buy stocks today at a discount of 20, more than 20%. Okay. Anyway, next, next. Next, 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 next. Okay, oh. uh, Then the last item that I wanted to remember is covered down. So the, the laptop. The bath time is at its best when you have the bath of filled with water and you have rubber down. And next. But it is most depressing when the bath does not have water and you don't have rubber down. In the Philippines, next. 
you have that much amount of water, so Singapore is so much filled with water, but we're this much, and then next, and then we have rubber ducking. So we always have to read that amount. Right? And then it's circulating in that particular, in that particular backup. But who is rubber ducking? If you've reviewed your macroeconomics and intermediate and advanced macroeconomics, if rubber ducking, next, next slide, is the most mathematical and the most technical term in the field of macroeconomics. Animal spirit. Animal spirit is defined as the confidence and optimism of consumers and investors to continue what they are doing. Without the animal spirit, there's no economic growth to talk about. That's why the first contribution of a president of a nation is that he should be able to deliver inspiring speeches. That's the first contribution of Obama to the American economy. You know, change! So, I mean, President Obama, then everybody cried. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, change! Then everybody cried. Have you watched that? Uh, one word, no, change! Everybody cried. <laughs> and then after four years, and then the unemployment rate has not gone down, so it's not enough to have good speeches. You have to have good economic policies. Okay, next. So, oops. in Hong Kong, they're all serious about the world, they don't know how to have fun, so they're always mad at each other, so we walk very slow and then they will shout at you, get out of it! So, and then they, they employ an international renowned uh, sculptor to make for them this giant property. And also it is resuscitated in Taiwan, two months after. Okay, and three days after, I mean, the celebration, selfies, picture taking, etc. Three days after. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> You're so happy, it cannot be. <laughs> okay, so that's why that their animal spirit is artificial. How about in the Philippines? The Philippines is so natural for us, it's deep inside us. But your friend is already. <laughs> Let's just eat. Next slide. Our newest animal spirit. It's no accident that the uh, yellow bear, no? <laughs> so, next slide. And then uh, the world uh, the world waited for this speech of, uh, of uh, Pope. Because he went all the way to Kaloba just to deliver the speech, and everybody in the world was waiting for what he would say, what he was about to say. And he said, uh, to those who lost everything, I do not know what to say to you. Everybody <laughs> yeah, And then everybody, all the philosopher commentator said, that's the greatest philosophical, theological speech book has ever been, any book has ever delivered. I do not know what to say to you, but I will give you. Let's eat. are natural economies. So we're very religious, we have faith, hope, and love. A macroeconomic translation is that spending. It's, it doesn't matter if I only have 100 pesos in my ATM, that's a payroll account, it's my birthday, I will withdraw the 100 pesos. <laughs> okay? So don't bother, bother about the, 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 the penalty statement. That is my birthday, I will spend it. So the, the money, MBTQ, the formula, MBTQ, the B is very, very high. In the macroeconomic importance of being young, many, and happy. We are so young, we are many. So if you are no longer young, just be happy. <laughs> okay? So, but if you are no longer young, if you are not yet, uh, still you are not happy, uh, you know what will happen to you. Okay? So, uh, strong multiplier effect, and then our oil companies are our modern heroes. Okay? So, next slide, last two slides. Okay. <laughs> so, Philippines is entering a golden age. Uh, Yes, because before our scarcity was taken us the other people's money, lowest valor. But right now, uh, we have so much surpluses and we are having so much problem. What to do with our money? So, from the sweat, blood, and tears of our people. So, no longer a question of are we growing. So, forget about micro analysis of our third quarter GDP. Forget about it. 
this bike starts, it's already at a discount. So, but our servants can support us for 8 to 10 percent for the next 8 to 10 years. That 1 trillion, that 80 billion dollars. And then the private sector is spending. So next. And then uh, the government, with good governance initiatives, had excellent fiscal management. Commissioner Genares collected money from everywhere, even from Al Pacquiao, etc. And then we have so much money. However, I'll do some developments. And, uh, and fear of audit. Uh, scared us from spending. That's a better problem than a government wanting to spend without money to spend. This is a better problem of a good, good government, effects of good government. And then the sources of growth are coming from the private sector, and 3,000 budgets, some of your budgets are still not here. I can only imagine what the Philippine economy can achieve once all of you graduate. Right? Okay, so in the meantime, there are poor, hungry, and jobless Filipinos, 27 pesos per day for 40, 28% of our Filipinos. So we need to scale up our infrastructure then, the utilization of existing projects, next. And therefore, uh, interest spending is going to be already, next. So therefore, we are on our way to enter the golden age, the road is looking at regardless of who will be our president. According to Dr. Villegas, even if you elect vice ganda, the maximum risk that we are going to face is 10%. If you elect vice president, so not so much discussion. So just go to the facts, and you will have better, better discussion points. So economic innovation will further shift our animal skill from bad news, from government action, and we have to engage our government. Be entitled and learn to translate your complaints to demand for goods and services from our government. And lastly, uh, uh, le next. So this requires the... Uh, okay, I end with this slide. So what should be our, after all the technical expertise, what should be our emotion for all this information and framework? Well, our feeling under, uh, we should be mad at the sleeping resources. Any business should be mad at the money, at the resources, assets, that is not multiplying. We have sales over assets. So you measure the, the, the multiplier, the turnaround of that asset into sales. So you, we should fear economic illiteracy. <laughs> Learn about your GDP, GNI, and NPI. So that you don't just discuss who will be the next president without discussing the impact. Okay, so solve our economic illiteracy uh, and then that will be, and then uh, disgust. We continue our disgust with corruption and bad governance. So, so that, this will translate into sustainability of reforms. And sadness, this is one of the most powerful emotions, sadness. We should be sad about the 27 pesos per day for many of our Filipinos. Okay? So that should that they should be included in our plans, in our growth, in our projects, in social responsibility of corporations. And lastly, for joy, we should be happy that we are a happy and optimistic. People. Okay? We are very, very happy. CNN had a very difficult time covering the Uganda, the Uganda tragedy, the Uganda event. Why? Because they were looking for some cases. So they can you know, focus on it. And then every time Filipino mga, mga tagatakoban will see the camera, what will they do? <laughs> okay? And then they will play basketball without available uh, one person type, portable one person, they will play basketball and the CSN reporters kept on wondering where would they get the, the water to bring up when they play basketball. Okay, anyway, so this, all this you translate into values and value that will eventually and ultimately result in the consumption multiplier and investment multiplier so that our, on our way to the golden age will be accelerated. So with that, I, I think uh, I've given you so much uh, and I hope you remember at least 50% of these guys. Thank you very much.